you so much, Madeline. Madeline is one of our uh, two daughters and real proud of her and, and her sister too. Thankfully, uh, they get their talent and their looks from their mother. So praise God for that. Um, and want to, uh, to greet you in the name and in the love of Jesus Christ and, and celebrate a, th a few things with you as we're getting started in worship. I want to first of all celebrate, um, celebrate the, the faithful giving of so many. Uh, and that's been such an encouragement and such a, a praise uh, to God. Uh, you, you've been so faithful in enabling the work of the ministry to continue and just really want to give you thanks for that. And then uh, also want to give thanks uh, and praise for uh, the food drive that happened a couple of weeks ago now. And actually, uh, with all the needs in our community, uh, the Salvation Army, uh, their pantry is actually being depleted. And so we're going to we're going to uh, have another one this week, as a matter of fact, and it's going to be the same kind of deal, uh, drive through between 1.30 and 4.30 on Thursday. We're going to be using the same list, and so that alphabetical list that's on our website, you'll be able to access that. And then if you can get some of the items that are listed under your, your last name, uh, the first letter of your last name, that'd be really helpful. You can just drive right through. We'll take the items from you and put them right in the trailer to... Um, to be ready to, to take. And uh, also celebrating that there's a group in our church that uh, they, they were called upon to make uh, 50 mask covers for medical personnel at, uh, at the hospital. It helps them preserve uh, their, their mask, the, the medical mask, helps them kind of make those last uh, uh, longer. They were called on to make 50 of those and they actually made like 70. So they went the extra mile and and praise God for that. And, uh, and I do want to tell you as we're getting started in worship that thanks be to God, uh, the rumors of the demise of Easter have been greatly exaggerated, right? Um, the, the fact that we are not together in person right now has not canceled Easter, right? Jesus is alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is what... Uh, Peter is inspired to share on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He says, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep its hold on him, could not hold him in its grip. And it, it, it just might be good news that somebody needs to hear this morning, that actually death and all the powers of darkness cannot, cannot keep a grip on those who belong to Christ Jesus. Thanks be to the Lord. And so we gather to celebrate that Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. And if you would, please join me in prayer. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this resurrection day, and we give you thanks for this opportunity to worship you, to praise your holy name, and to celebrate, and to orient our souls toward the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. And Lord, we like to ask that at this very moment, that family rooms, that, that kitchens, that, that desks and offices and all of the places that folks are joining together, that they would become sanctuaries, places that are holy, holy because you are there, Lord. You've told us that where two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, that you are right there in their midst, and we claim that promise today. We thank you for that promise because we have gathered in an unusual way for sure, but Lord, you know our hearts. You know that we've gathered for you, so be with us. Make your presence known. Fill our hearts with your joy and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
name of the Lord and will you join me in our affirmation of faith this morning. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In, in all things, things we are more than, than conquerors, conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. God say, Amen. 
Well, as we begin our time of prayer this morning, and we, of course, want to continue to pray for our nation and the world, we also want to pray for our church and our families. Uh, and today, our uh, hospital updates are that Eunice Gogger is in the hospital at this time, and also Linda Metz is at Hospice House for a time of respite. So we want to keep them in our prayers as well. So let's be in the spirit of prayer together this morning. God of all power and majesty, with the rising of the sun, you have raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so we bow before you in awe and wonder. Lord, we thank you that we are able to join together and connect from different locations through technology during this unprecedented time. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to clear our minds from the stresses, distractions, and worries of this life and allow us to shift our focus to you and on the hope, the joy, and the pre peace that only you can bring. Lord, today we especially pray that you will renew our spirits in a very real and meaningful way. And so we come to you with hearts wide open and we call out, come Holy Spirit, come. And this year, O oh God, on this Easter morning, we pray for you to teach us to extend Easter beyond just this one high holy day. Help us, Lord, we pray to learn to rest in your hope and to stand firm on your promises each and every day of our lives and to keep us ever mindful that we are your Easter people, that you have saved us, redeemed us, chosen us, and indeed, Lord, you offer us new life. And so, Lord, we praise you on this bright and glorious day. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And on this day, on this day, Father God, we especially give you thanks and praise for the gift and the promise of newness of life, both here and now and in the life yet to come. And Lord, we would pray now that you would pour out your blessings on Jeremy as he brings us your word. May we, your Easter people, hear it with joy. May it renew our hope. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, may it move us to act. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, who taught us to pray, praying, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The church family, everyone watching online, I want you guys to sing like you're walking out that tomb, just like God called Jesus out of that tomb because he is risen this morning. So let's celebrate that. Sing it. 
heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, to your glorious day. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. I'd like to invite you this time to give ear to the reading of God's Word. It comes to us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and we're reading verses 1 through 12. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell the, his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who, had told the, who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the, the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. And I, I'd love it if we could pray together. Would you please join me in prayer? God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And what we'd like to ask specifically right now is for revelation, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, the veil would be lifted, our hearts, the eyes of our hearts would be opened so that we could see Jesus. Lord, yes, crucified. Yes, laid in a grave. And yet risen and yet alive and reigning in glory. Lord, enable us this morning to see Jesus, his love, his hope. We pray in his most holy name. Amen. Amen. So um, for the last few weeks, we've been uh, talking about this human tendency to want to, to tame Jesus. That is to diminish who he is, to diminish his authority. Uh, and, 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 you know, the truth is, this is a human tendency that we all have, and we all have it because th the truth is that we actually have to do something with Jesus. Jesus is just too important. He's too essential. He's too central to history to be ignored. As a matter of fact, H.G. Uh, Wells uh, once said, I am an historian. I'm not a believer. But I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. And so, we all actually have to do something with Jesus. And what we find is that folks who are not believers, that they tend to, they tend to want to acknowledge that, yeah, Jesus was really influential, and yet to find ways of denying his divinity. To say, yeah, yeah, he, he's a great moral teacher, he has some really great things to say, but he was not God. But you see, it's not just unbelievers, it's not just folks who haven't come to the Lord yet who try to tame Jesus to make him less than he truly is. 
It's actually also a temptation for us who are believers. We, we've been praying over these last few weeks, Lord, would you show us the ways that we've tried to tame our Savior? That is to say, Lord, how have we tried to make following Jesus easier, less costly, less radical? How have we tried to tame our Savior? Because we have this temptation, even after we hand our lives over to Jesus, to in certain ways want to actually take back some of that authority from Jesus, to want to take back some of that trust and take back parts and pieces of our lives. There is this temptation, even when, among believers, to want to tame Jesus. Now today, today on Easter Day, on Resurrection Day, we're talking about the most important truth that we must actually push back against any, any attempt to tame Jesus around this truth. It's too important, it's too central, and of course that truth is that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Because here's, here's what's true, here's what's true. If Jesus Christ, in fact, is raised from the dead, if he was crucified and yet on the third day he was raised from the dead, if that is true, it is actually impossible to overstate the implications of that for us, for you, for me, for the world. You know, um, there are lots of folks these days who think that, um, and they will say, that religion is essentially, um, essentially a matter of preference, right? That just find you a religion that suits you. Find your religion if you're into that kind of thing. Find you a spirituality that kind of fits you, that, that fits your needs, that, that you, you think is right. You know, and then, and then folks will say, folks will say, you know, I could never be a Christian, because I, I have a problem with some things that are in the Bible. And the thing is this, that the primary question about Christianity is not, do I have a problem with some things that are in the Bible? The primary question, the first question to ask is not, do I have a problem with things in the Bible? The first question to ask is actually, is it true? Is it actually true? Because, listen, if Jesus is still in the grave, then we can just play around with religion. We can just talk about nice ideas that maybe uh, bring us some comfort. We can just manipulate Jesus and make him whatever it is that we would like to make him. We'd like, we can take whatever angle we want on Jesus. But if in fact, and I know that it is true, if in fact Jesus Christ is alive, if he really is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, if he really is, if he really is coming again to set the world to rights, if that is true, and I believe, I believe with all of my heart that it is, then we can't actually tame Jesus. We can't actually just do what we want with him. The only suitable response before the king of kings is to bow, bend the knee to him. It is to bend the knee. It is to bow before him and call him Lord. You see, um, so, so many times this kind of same story gets told about the resurrection. And, and, and if we could just be transparent about what it is, it is an attempt to tame Jesus. It's an attempt to be nice about it, and yet, and yet, to tame Jesus. And the story goes something like this. If you, if you want to explain away the truth of the resurrection, and you want to be nice about it, it sounds like this. You know, Jesus was a great teacher. He was in the right time, at the right place, with the right ideas. And yet, his teaching, some of it was kind of radical. And so he got crossways with the authorities, with the religious authorities, with the civil authorities, and they put him to death. He was a martyr for his cause. And so it was very sad. And his followers, after his death, they obviously grieved. But then there came a point when something happened inside of them, right? There, there was something that happened. You could call it psychological. You could call it spiritual. But something began to stir. You know, they felt something. They felt forgiven. They, they felt comforted. They felt like something new was starting. And so over time, this legend developed, right? This legend developed that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that legend is symbolic, right? It, it represents these truths that they experienced. It's about renewal. It's about restoration. It's about spring coming. You know, it's about this sort of thing. And this actually appeals to folks who want to acknowledge Jesus, and yet they want to deny who he really is, right? Right? The problem with this story is that, it, you know, it's, it's very nice that people want to be nice about denying Jesus, right, how they do it. But the problem with this story is that it's completely implausible. That it actually does not in any way account for what has actually happened. Listen, the early followers, think about this now. The early followers never held vigil at Jesus' grave, right? They never did. 
In fact, the, the women were going to the tomb. They were going to the tomb, but they were going to anoint a dead body. And you can be sure that if he were still in the grave, that there would have been a stream of his followers coming to pay tribute to him at his grave. It never happened. It never happened. From the very beginning, believers declared the truth that Jesus Christ is alive. And you know, we tend to think, we tend to think that ancient people were just really apt to believe anything. Like you could just tell them whatever you wanted and they, and they were so ignorant that they would just say, oh yeah, of course, yeah, I believe you, you said it, it's gotta be true. And so the thought is that somebody just made up this story and they told it to other believers and they said, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, Jesus came out of the grave. That's great. I, I would totally believe that. But that's not true at all. Look at what actually happens. Look at what happens. Jesus had told them repeatedly, his followers, again and again, had told them, you know what, I, 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 according to the Scriptures, I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be crucified. But on the third day, I'll be raised from the dead. He had told them that multiple times. And yet, when he is killed... The disciples go into hiding. The men go into hiding. The women are brave enough to go, but they don't go to greet a risen Savior. They go to anoint a dead body. And when they go back to tell the men, listen to what, the, listen to what their response is. The story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. You know, we act like ancient people were just apt to believe any old thing that you would tell them, but in fact, they were skeptical. They were skeptical for different reasons than people today are skeptical. That's true. But they were skeptical nonetheless. You see, in Jesus' day, there were many Jews who believed in the resurrection, but they believed in what was called a general resurrection or an all-at-once resurrection. There was no idea that just one person was going to be raised, and there was no concept that the Messiah would need to be raised. Because the Messiah was not supposed to be killed. He was supposed to reign. He was supposed to conquer, vanquish the enemies of the people of God. He was not supposed to be killed, not supposed to be needing to be resurrected. And yet, and yet, they came to believe. There was this massive shift in their thinking. Why? Why? We consider all of these facts, and we think about the fact that, you know what, okay, if they were going to make up a story, if they were going to make up a legend to try to promote their religion, to promote their principles, they would have made up a way better story than this one, right? A way better story because, listen, and this is not me, this is the culture of the period. We know in the Roman culture that they looked down severely on women. Women were not respected. They were not even considered to be valid witnesses in legal proceedings, so if you're going to make up a story, you make up a better one than this. You don't have women being the first witnesses to the story. And by the way, you don't make up a story where your leaders, where your saints look like idiots. You just don't do it. You see, the gospel account, if we just look at it as literature, it's not written as a legend. It's actually written as an historical eyewitness account. And there are way better ways. If you were going to make up a fraud, if you were going to perpetrate a fraud, there are way better ways to do it. This is actually written as an eyewitness account. The only reason that it would be written like this is that it actually happened like this. And I tell you, it's, only, it's the only rational explanation for the fact that so many early believers, so many early believers gave their lives for Jesus Christ. All of the disciples, except for one, gave their lives for Jesus. And it was the, the only reason that they were killed is that they were followers of Jesus and they would not renounce their allegiance to Jesus. That is the only reason that they were killed. And think about this now. If they were perpetrating a fraud, if they were, if they were just forming a religion around some nice ideas, there is no way that they would have gone through with it. They would have renounced Christ, renounced these ideas, and yet they didn't. Not one of them, not one of these disciples turned back. Not one of these 11 would fail to offer their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Any, any one of hundreds of witnesses to the resurrected Jesus could have come forward and said, you know what, this is just a fraud. They could have let word out, but they never did. They never did. They all gave their lives. They put their lives on the line for Jesus Christ. Why? Because they had met the risen Savior. And they knew that the God who raised him from the dead would give life also to their mortal bodies. They knew it. And so, <laughs> they weren't part of a concocting a fraud. They weren't part of writing a legend. What, what they were is they were surprised by a miracle. 
This is not something that happens. People don't just, rate, get, just come back from the dead. We know this. It was a miracle. And if you are skeptical, listen, if you are skeptical about this, I get it. I do. We know people don't just come back from the dead. I get it. But what I want to ask, what I want to ask is that you would allow me to just lay out what's at stake here. And as I do that, to be willing to have a heart and a mind that's open enough to this, that you would be willing for Jesus to reveal the truth of who he is, of the fact that he's alive, of his love, and the truth of the gospel to you. Uh, essentially, what I want to ask is that you would be willing to have the attitude that Peter had. Now, the women come and they, and they tell the, the, the fact that Jesus Christ is raised. And, and the disciples' response is, it sounds like nonsense. They didn't believe. But listen to what Peter does. This is verse 12. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. That's what I want to ask you to do, is just be willing to wonder what happened. Wonder what actually is the best explanation for what has actually occurred. Just be willing to wonder, because here's what's at stake. Here's the first thing. What, what I know to be true, what I know is true, is that the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, it means that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. He is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. What we find as we look into the Old Testament, as we look in the Old Testament, is that it is all pointing forward to Jesus. It is all pointing forward to a promise that is fulfilled in Jesus. And so as we look through, we see that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, that he's going to be the father of this vast people who are going to live by faith as he did. Jesus is the fulfillment of, of the prophecy of Moses. He's the greater Moses who, who, leads, who leads people out of slavery to sin and death. Not just slavery to Egypt, but slavery to sin and death. Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to David that David would have this eternal king who would be in his family line. That is Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise for a Savior, for a Messiah who would come and who would establish this whole new relationship with God that we would enter into through the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. Jesus is God's great yes to all of his promises. Now, as some may say at this point, and it's fair, right? Okay, um, why should I care about that, right? Like, okay, what if I don't care about the Scriptures? Why would this mean anything to me? And here's what I want to tell you is that <laughs> if the Scriptures have been fulfilled, then you can be too. If the Scriptures have been fulfilled, then you can be true. And here's why. Here's why. Because at the heart of the Scriptures, at the heart of the Scriptures is God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ. And at the heart of God's plan of salvation in Jesus Christ is, it is God's movement in this world to bring us back to life, to restore us to the life that we were made to have. As Jesus says, the life that is really life, abundant life, life to the full. He has come to actually give us that. You know, the truth is, wh whether we want to recognize it or not, embrace it or not, whether we resent it, the truth is that all of us, every one of us, every human being has a longing for the divine. We have a longing for God. We long for purpose and meaning that, that what we find ultimately, this world can't give us. We long for this sort of love that is beyond usefulness, that is beyond our achievements. In fact, a love that holds us even in our failures. We long for that kind of love. We, we long for the world to be made right. We see injustice in the world. We see brokenness in the world. We see disease. We see death in the world. And we long for the world to be something better than it is. We hunger, we hunger for this fellowship with the divine, for this fellowship, this relationship with God. We long for eternity. We know somehow inside of us, we know that we are not meant to die. And in fact, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that God has placed eternity in the human heart. And so if Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then in fact the scriptures have been fulfilled. And if the scriptures have been fulfilled, then in fact the longings of our soul can be fulfilled. That's why Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, 
and I will give you rest. And those who come to Jesus find that they actually do find rest. They find a place of peace and of wholeness, of healing in Jesus. This is, listen, this is why Jesus says, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the Scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And we find that as we come to Jesus, we are drinking drinking deeply of that which is life, the thirst of our souls is satisfied in Jesus. And that, and that, listen, that really leads us to our next point, and that is that the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead is confirmation. The way some people say it is that, that the resurrection of Jesus is his vindication, that Jesus was vindicated, meaning he was proven to be right. He was proven to be trustworthy and true. So what he says about himself is true. What he says about us is true. What he says about the world is true. And so when we read things like this, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, when Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, what we understand by this is that actually Jesus is not just some very special person. He's not just a prophet. He's not a special religious teacher. He is actually God, that God was not satisfied that we would be lost to him, that actually he came. He came in the flesh. The Son of God made flesh. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And so what Jesus says about himself is vindicated, is confirmed, is shown to be true. But not only that, what he said about us. I mean, I think about the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of this lost son who squanders his inheritance in sinful living, who goes far away from his father, and yet, and yet, this father's heart still yearns for him to return. And when he comes to the end of himself and he turns back toward his father, his father runs to embrace him. What he is telling us is that this is God's heart for us. And when he tells us that, we can know that it's true that he longs for our return. He longs for us to be restored as his children. He longs to lavish that love upon us to call us his children. He longs for us to come home. Jesus even said that when one lost sinner comes home, that there is a party in heaven. That's how God feels about us. It's revealed in Jesus, and it is confirmed in his resurrection. And not only that, what Jesus says about the world is true. When he says that he will return at what he calls the renewal of all things, when he says that there is a day when war will cease, when disease will cease, when even death will be defeated, we can know that that is true. It is confirmed. His word is vindicated. He will come again and set the world to rights. And so finally, finally what we understand is that the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead means that we have a real hope, a living hope, a hope that is spoken into our lives, into every situation in our lives, because in every situation we find that the living Savior is walking with us and He is revealing His love, He is revealing His hope into our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is speaking it into our lives. Listen, listen, listen. If Jesus Christ conquered the grave, what situation in our lives can He not handle? If Jesus conquered the grave, what darkness, what night is too dark for him to speak light into? What situation is so dire that he can't speak peace and healing over? What what condition, what diagnosis is so dire that he cannot declare life over it? Romans 8, 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. You know, just a few days ago, there was an article that appeared in uh, the Washington Post. The title of the article, get this, the title of the article, Even those of us who don't believe need what religion can provide right now. Even those of us who don't believe need what religion can provide right now. And in that article, the, ar- the, the author says, and this is a quote, we don't need religion, but as the crisis reminds us, we still need certain things that religion can provide. We need ways to express gratitude, to face death, to comfort ourselves. We need community and ritual and dates that can't easily be deleted and I just have to say first of all about that is um, goodness there's something really just profoundly sad about that 
Because it's kind of like saying, you know what, we don't need water, but we sure are thirsty. There's something really profoundly sad about it. But you know, in another way, there's something, there's something really true about it. Because, in fact, we don't just need religion. We don't just need nice ideas, principles, rituals, celebration. We don't just need nice ideas and things that bring us a little warm, fuzzy feeling. We don't just need religion. We need a death-defying Savior who rolled back the stone and walked out of the grave and is alive today. That's what we need today. We need Jesus Christ because in him we find our rest, our peace, our joy, our comfort because he is, in fact, not just an idea, not a concept, not a legend. He is, in fact, God and he is alive. And I would say, if you don't know him, if you don't know him, just please allow yourself the grace to wonder what really happened on that day 2,000 years ago. What really happened? What really accounts for all of the evidence? Allow yourself the grace to just crack open your heart enough for the Lord to come and reveal his life and his love to you so that you can find in him what is truly life. May it be so in Jesus' name. And, And if you would, I'd like to invite us to please pray together. Oh, Lord, we we give you praise and thanks because you are our risen Savior, because you've invited us to come to you and find in you that which is truly life, and we do come to you. We pray especially right now for any who are sort of on the fence, Lord, who think there might be something to this, who yearn for there to be something to this. Lord, would you show... (laughs) Would you show them your love and your life? Would you... Reveal yourself to them in such a way that that they are able to turn their lives over to you and in doing so to find that which is really life. And we pray for that earnestly in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Lord, God bless you and go in the peace of Christ.